I was, I was the first gaijin they hired in the egg yogurt. So 300 Japanese guys and me, this white kid. Paul, I want to thank you for taking the time to come here. Thank I've you, known man. you for a really long time. Yep. You've been in Japan for how long now? On and off for 20 years. I'm 20 doing my years. third tour of duty right now. Third tour? <laughs> But not with the same company. It's always I've how many? Tell, you Fifteen companies. Fifteen different companies. I don't know. I haven't counted. But it's, it's more. It's tennis. Yeah. But you speak Japanese as well. I try. And you read and write as well. No, you I used learn. to. I used to. Used to. When I, you know, when, 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 I, when I thought I was being studious, my first job. I actually worked for Chiyoda Kako Kensetsu starting in 1992. What kind of company is that? That is that was Japan's premier engineering procurement construction company in the hydrocarbon sector. Um, and so they're responsible for building at least half of all the hydrocarbon infrastructure in Japan, about a quarter of all the hydrocarbon infrastructure in the Middle East, and about a third of all of it in Southeast Asia. Were you the CEO? Oh, you weren't the CEO. Dude, I was 24 years old. You were 24 old. years old. I was, no, you, you didn't I get was, up there yet. I didn't know jack about squat. Right, about, about anything. So you came in, they took you in, and yeah, what did you so do? I was, I was the first gaijin they hired in the egg yoga. So 300 Japanese guys and me this white kid who, who like, I, I, I'd studied Japanese at that point for six months because I came to Japan didn't have anything. And I basically knew enough Japanese to say, where's the bathroom? Or, oh, they never don't go this out. I didn't say it that well. Right, right, right. And I had no idea what the answer was. <laughs> then, and then we go to body language. Yeah, over here, it's like, can you point? <laughs> so the first six months I was with him, I had five or six dictionaries on my desk. And my job for the first six months, we had a daily newspaper that would come out, newspaper six pages of, of printed, here's all the business that we want to tell about internally that we're doing around the world today. And this came out daily, okay. all in Japanese. Mm -hmm. And my job was by the end of the day, could I get through those six pages <laughs> of, of actually reading what they say. And then translate it? At the same, just to it was, read it. It was just to like, so what is this saying? And they're paying you to do this. Well, it wasn't, that wasn't the job. The job was to be part of the business development group for the brand new environmental business development group, Kankyu Egg Yoga, um, which was the very first time that they'd ever built one of these, that they, this department existed. Right. Um, and so the responsibility was to sell flue gas desulfurization scrubbers, FTD scrubbers, okay. to coal-fired power plants. Right. And our, our, we were living in Japan, and our sales territory was planet Earth, ex-Japan. Wow. So, um, but after about six months, I said, hey, I, I met a girl and we're getting engaged. Said, oh, you must be serious about staying here. Um, and literally within a month, my real job started. Um, so, but, you know, I went, I went native in a big way, Lance. After I got out of the Japanese language school, which I went to for six months, I basically got to the point where I'm not a good student. And I got to the point where I'm not going to be able to get to the next class. It's just not going to work for me. Um, wait, let's, let's get to, let's start from the beginning. How did wait? First, how did you come here? It was an accident. <laughs> okay, well then let's start from this. Where <laughs> so, were you, where so were you born? Where were you born first of all? Oh, uh, California, California, Sacramento. You have siblings. I'm an only child. Only child. Broke my mother's heart when I left home at 15. Your parents doing okay? They're good. They're still with us. They're pretty genki. All right. Um, and they, they I'm going to see them in about uh, 10 days. I got a message from my mom saying I'm so excited to see you. But you were born in Sacramento. I was born in Sacramento. I don't remember any of it. Okay. I was there, they tell me. Right. Um, <laughs> went to New Jersey, um, and then the, I, have, I have a couple of memories in, in living in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And then when we were four, we moved to New Orleans, and I grew up in New Orleans. Okay. Now, what um, did your father do, or your mother? Uh, my father, a uh, fairly traditional, old-school, American nuclear-type family. Um, he was in, in insurance, okay. which, and he's now... So he's now celebrating 56 years of working in financial services and still going strong. And still going strong. He's 80 years old. He still works like. Is it his company? Or he works. With no, the company? no. He he worked for uh, the first. He worked for a company called Mutual Benefit Life Insurance, which is no more. Um, he was the youngest general manager they'd ever had in the history of the company. He was like 31, 32 years old when they offered him the Louisiana uh, agency. Okay. He, they gave him a choice: that we have El Paso, or you can take Louisiana. Which one do you want? And this was 1970, 1971, right. before the oil shocks. And but he chose New Orleans, and then because of the oil shocks, you know that was the, that was the time in Louisiana and Texas. Every redneck had a Cadillac. 
Um, the, the this dressing, you know, just they were spending money like crazy. It was the, they had it. it was the best time in the world to be in New Orleans. The city that Care Forgot really did forget. <laughs> and you know, I think I remember the police going on strike one year during Mardi Gras. The weeds in the middle of the street getting to six, six feet tall. It was a really interesting place to grow up. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> um, did, you, did your accent become? Really I had I had, had a, a southern drawl. Real drawl. Uh, I had one for sure. Spoke, yes. I had one for sure. Um, and then I, I decided I, I told my parents I want to go to boarding school. And they're like, what? Why do you want to go to boarding At what school? Age? I was I was fourteen or fifteen when I told them, and they'd introduced the idea to me when I was twelve, and and they said, oh that looks really cool. Um, and then when I got a bit older, I said, I want to do this. And they're like, no, 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 you don't want to do that. Were you the type of kid that was really academically <clears throat> inclined? I was, I was pretty good academically when mm -hmm. I was younger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Were you sports minded? Did you no, I was, I was musically oriented. So I played the trombone. So I, I played the trombone from the second grade until I graduated high school. And the trombone mm -hmm. took me to all kinds of jazz concerts all around America. I marched in the Disney World Parade when I was like 13. Um, we played at Tulane basketball games in the pep, in the pep rally in the Superdome. Um, we, I played in the, the, the school marching band, and we marched in all the, uh, the, so you were the, good. the Mardi Gras parades. So you were really good. I was, I was you know, mate, everybody sounds good when you're with 50 people. Oh, you're just, okay. So it was a big group. So you, you told me. You but but I, was in, I was in the jazz band. I was in the marching band. I was in the orchestra band. I was in the pit orchestra. Um, that, that was, music was my thing. That was your thing, okay. And I swam. I was a swimmer. Okay. Um, so so I, did, I did those two things. Um, as a kid, so yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. But then I just kind of after I went to boarding school, so I went to the only boarding school in America that didn't at have a swimming at pool. 14, at didn't 14. have a boarding, didn't have a swimming pool. At fourteen, I actually went at I was probably fifteen, fifteen and a half. And where was the boarding school? So the boarding school was in Connecticut. Oh, you wanted called. to stay in the states. You didn't want to go out. Somewhere. Well, this was this was some stuff. I'm okay. getting there. All right, get me there. Get me there. All right. I was uh, fifteen. I went to the Taft School in Watertown, Connecticut, which is a very good school. Um, and I applied to like six or seven schools, and I didn't get into Exeter. I didn't get into Andover, and I and I found out years later, my parents were going to tell me, "No, you can't go," because of the expense. No, because they didn't want their kid to leave. Oh, okay. And and then I got into Taft, which was one of the top schools. They because obviously Taft was like, "Oh, we found somebody from Louisiana who can read and write. <laughs> Let's take him." <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, uh, uh, I, I got into the school. My parents were going to tell me no, but they went to the parent-teacher conference that night to the school I was going to in New Orleans, Isidore Newman High School, the only non-Jewish kid at the Jewish high school. Okay. <laughs> and the headmaster pulled him aside and said, you need to let him go because he's like, you know, he's, he's, he's ready. And they're like, no, no, no. And he's like, you you're going to regret if you don't let him go. Now let me ask you this. Are you parents, did they have you when they were young or did they have you when they were a little bit older? By the standard of the day, they were a little bit older. They were in their mid-twenties, which today oh, would be they, young. Come on, which would today oh, would be come young. On. That's but right. They were That's true because most people had it they absolutely. Flew right out of high school. Right, right. As, so, as soon as they finished college. So they, they got married when they were 18 and 19 years old. That's still good. So they were together for six years before they had a kid. Wow. And they just celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary. 63? Well, how old is your dad now? You remember how uh, he turns 81 in December. 81. Uh, wow. We're 25 years apart exactly. Okay. So he, he's December 22nd. I'm December 25th. So I. My I, son's born December 25th. My first it, son. Ah, it's a great yeah, day to be born. Yeah. And my dad, when I was born, he called all the relatives. The story is, and said, "I don't really care, but you can send two presents, or you can send nothing." That's how I did my. Because son. when he grew up, everyone gave him just one present. Right. And he said, "I'm I'm not going to let my, that happen." And so, you know, I was the only, I was a single kid. Every kid in the neighborhood thought I was spoiled rotten because at Christmas, I'd get, uh, you know, there's one kid in the tree. There's hardly any room for any more presents. <laughs> well, this side is, this half is birthday and this half is Christmas. Right. But did you cel celebrate your birthday at the same time or do you celebrate it at a different time? <coughs> because when I do, my son's uh, born at 6 p.m. Right. So Similar the time. birthday goes... I mean, every, all his brothers can come in and they can play with the gifts up until 3. Okay. Then from 3 to 6, no birthday one does time. anything. Then at 6 o'clock, his birthday starts. Right, right, right. And he can open his gifts, then they can play with their gifts again. Right, right. So the way we did it was, and again, because I was an only child, so there's right. no competition. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. um, we would do Christmas in the morning and birthday in the evening. Wow. Right. And I kinda, we still kind of do that now. 
Um, although by the time by the time we get to the birthday cake, everybody's like, I don't think I can eat another thing. <laughs> right. That's beautiful. So you uh, get to have both. So you never felt bad about being born on Christmas. Never. Uh -uh. A lot of people uh -uh. Uh -uh. like you, like your father for one. Yeah, yeah. It was tough for him, I think. But so but so you go to the school. You go to this. So I go to this school, school and. Uh, you know, and I'm, everyone that likes diversity, right? Diversity at that point is we need how many, how many states and how many countries do people come from? So we, we got a guy that's come from Louisiana, <laughs> can read and write. And six months later, my parents moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. And the, the center of the Taft universe is Cincinnati, Ohio. And they have like 25 kids from Cincinnati. And they're like, we don't need any more kids from <laughs> Cincinnati. So Taft, Cincinnati is the Taft city. So you got the Taft Museum, you got Taft Highway, Senator Taft, the whole Taft family is from there, which we didn't know, of course, when we moved there. Um, and it's so funny, my, when my parents moved to Cincinnati, they would tell everyone, yes, our son goes to Taft. And people were like, really? So Taft, the Taft High School in Cincinnati was apparently in a very low income neighborhood, and mostly kids of color. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you just moved here to take over this insurance agency and your kid goes to the Taft School? What? That wasn't the same school. <laughs> no, the, well, this is the public school the in, public school in they Cincinnati. Thought, okay, they're not the private not the, school. Not the one where, you know, right, right. lots of, of uh, it's a very different world. It's okay. a very different world. Right, right. Uh, uh. So anyway, so then what was it like for you in school, in boarding school? Did you miss your parents? Well, they were right there, so you didn't miss them. Well, not, I mean, they were, I was in Connecticut. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, and right. it, you know, this is pre-internet. This is pre, so right. the way you talk to people is you would line up on Sunday evening in the payphone on the wall. Um, and you know you would call your folks for ten minutes or not totally up to you know there was no rule like that but right. it was Sunday evening people would sit in the in what we called the T it was a hallway and right. this like hundred year old brick building um, and just wait for your turn on the phone and pump in the quarters what was it like it was it an all boys school no was it, it was actually the first school to go co-ed in the United States in 1971 they went co-ed so what was the percentage. By then, it was almost 50-50. Oh, really? This, is, this would have been 80, I went there in 82. Okay. 82, 83 was my first year to go there. Um, so did you stay in the dormitory? You had yes, yeah, yeah, as a boarding student, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But not all the people were boarding students. Some people um, close At by. that point, there were like 500 kids in the school, about 420-ish okay. were boarders, okay. and 80 were what we called day students. Right, right. Yeah. So what was it like? It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, 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 you know, as I get older, it was, it was, it was better as I get older. <laughs> you know, academically, extremely rigorous. Um, this, this used to be the feeder school for like Yale okay. um, back in the day when that system was still in place. Mm -hmm. um, but still, the, uh, the the school feeds all the IVs and and all the top schools usually. Mm -hmm. um, and then the class of 1985, the biggest school of matriculation was the University of Colorado Boulder. That's where you go, went. buffs. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a it was a scandal in the school because like what do you mean it's not Harvard or Princeton or or Dartmouth or Colorado that party school it's like yeah <laughs> so it was a uh, but it's turned out well I don't know if the school cares if it turns out well but it turned out well for those of us that went there you went there I went there I went to Boulder and graduated okay. in eighty nine what'd you study international affairs concentration Western Europe language was French <laughs> so of course I spent my entire adult life in Asia <laughs> so you got pretty good with French. She was a really good girlfriend. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. I did do a summer program in France, and my French got much better that summer. Right, right, right. Do you still speak French? Right. Basically, yeah. no. no. Un petit yeah. peu. That's, That's about it. it. That's it. Do you Un croissant. Un croissant. Right, right. Do you, go, do you go to France every now? No, I Not don't. But you know what? So you don't have an affinity for 12, it. You thought you did. Twelve, fifteen years ago. Twelve years ago. I actually. The, the, the girlfriend that I made that summer, I went to her wedding and brought my family from Japan. How, and you, I, and you I got to stay in contact with her the whole time? Yes. Okay. And so I lived with a homestay family. And this was the niece of the homestay family. Okay. And over the years, and then so when she got married, she invited I, brought, I brought my, because my, everybody thought we were going to be the, the thing. My parents came from Cincinnati, went to Paris and to France for the wedding. and. The grandmother got up and said, oh, boy, you come. <laughs> so I, the, how long do you guys, just for a year, you guys were boyfriend? For a girlfriend? couple years. For a couple years. It was, okay. But it was definitely a long distance thing. Cause okay. It was, uh, she was in France and I went back to, to America. Yeah. Wow. So tell me, so out of school, what, did, what happened straight out of school? So straight out of school, I've, you know, my dream, live and work abroad. I'm being an international business guy. 
Um, and about a week before I had, was going to buy a plane ticket, go to France with no job, no, nothing, um, one of the guys I've been doing temp work for in Boulder called me and said, hey, would you come work for me? I was, what, I was 21, 22 years old. He was a, a, a startup guy. Um, name was Bink Selby, Howard Selby. Um, he and a bunch of other hippies created the very first uh, commercialized word processor in 1975. About the same time Celestial Seasonings got started and a couple of other famous Colorado Boulder companies. Um, and these guys hit it big. And in the late 70s, their company IPO'd and they were each worth like $35 million at the time. You were and these, I was working for him. Wait, when that happened? No, no, no. no. After he was, this is many years later. He was in his 40s at this, by okay, the time okay. I met him. Right. And so I was his personal assistant um, for about two years, and he was making one, what we now call a laptop computer. And we were making this in the airplane hangar at the Boulder Airport with a CNC machine downstairs sitting next to one of his three airplanes, milling out solid pieces of blocks of plastic to make the chassis for this thing called a laptop computer. Now, what the hell is a laptop computer? At that point, I think we had the Toshiba satellite computers, which were suitcases. But he created what today you would, you would see, and, oh, that's a laptop computer. And in 1989, we created the very first one. The only thing that survived from that is the, uh, the trackball in the keyboard. IBM has it. It's around Lenovo. That trackball, he invented that. So he invented the whole machine. He gave it to IBM to evaluate. They gave him some money for the evaluation. And part of the deal that he had to sign off on was, we get to keep the IP if we do the evaluation. And they ended up keeping the, that in-keyboard trackball. Um, but it had a green screen. It had a, a, a floppy disk compartment. Um, he just he, he kept adding more bells and whistles to it. Mm -hmm. And so he missed the market. Wow. <coughs> and he probably, I don't know, spent several million dollars of his own money. Uh, but he was also creating like espresso, computerized espresso machines. Right. And so I worked a lot on that. We had a bunch of, of places around Boulder at restaurants where we were testing out the machines and they would break down and we'd get calls and they'd send me out with a screwdriver and say, I'm here to fix the machine. I've got no bloody idea what I'm doing. Right. I gotta fix the machine. But this is when the breakfast drink of choice in America was Diet Coke. So I think there were six Starbucks restaurants um, and there was like some other coffee chain nobody's ever heard of. But this was, this was like radical. We're gonna, we're gonna, make, we're gonna make coffee. And so we had this amazing uh, beta, alpha version of the coffee machine. It sat on the counter in the, in the company kitchen. It was made out of glass. Mm -hmm. So you could see all the workings going on. Right. Um, and everybody in the office was high on coffee all day long. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, and he went to Bun in Chicago to try to sell them the technology. Um, and it didn't. But there were like 15 people working in this company. Um, of the 15, 12 were like PhD electrical engineers and, and computer scientist types. There was an accountant and then there was me. And I, I literally, I was the secretary. I was, I was the doorstop to get to in. So I was answering the phone, I was making the coffee, I was the co-pilot on the company plane sometimes. No idea what I'm doing. Um, which was, it was a great, like, you know, working man's MBA exposure to how business works. For how long? Uh, about 18 months. 18 months. Are you and, still in contact with him? Um, not now. No, we've lost touch. But is he still doing okay? Do you I, you know, he him? would be, you know, be in his 70s, mm -hmm. late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, I believe he's still, uh, you know, in Colorado. But he did well. He did well. He did quite well for himself. Because he had so many things out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, Something tra had to hit. Traditional opera, uh, you know, art entrepreneur. So he was mm -hmm. also working at, at uh, high definition television. Right. He had this concept of rotating mirrors and lasers um, I mean, smoke and mirrors. It was the epitome of smoke and mirrors to create high definition TV on a, like an entire wall. Okay. And he, you know, he's way ahead of his time. He's he's got like a hundred patents that he's submitted. Um, so he was, a, but he was kind of an absent-minded professor guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, at times he could be super business savvy, yeah. and other times he was yeah. like just driving down the road and like go through the red lights, like what? Because he was just thinking so right. much. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> uh, but that was my exposure. And then I said, you know what? This is this is fun, but it's not getting me to where I want to go. So then what'd you do? And so in 1991, um, and he helped me with my decision because as he was leaving for a six-week bicycle trip in Italy, um, he had the accountant when she came back from the airport fire me because the business wasn't happening and, and too much outgoing. And I figured I was, you know, I was so dumb and young and I didn't know anything. I'm the cheapest guy here by a mile. They're never going to fire me. I'm gone. And so I ended up doing a bit of uh, uh, telemarketing for about two months to make make ends meet, 
and I collected up a, a bit of money, saved about 1500 bucks, did some research, and where in the world are, is, is international business happening? And it was either Taiwan or Japan. And I, I literally took out a coin, heads Japan, tails Taiwan, I'm going to Japan. And six weeks later, I showed up. <laughs> Just like that? Just like that. You know, you know I had, a, I had a, a, a legal pad page of paper with about 20 names on it of a name and a Japanese phone number of somebody's cousin, second wife, divorced <laughs> husband who knew somebody in Japan and this was their name and phone number. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> and I got to Japan and at that time actually my uncle was based in Yokosuka in the Navy and he was living off base so my aunt graciously allowed me to stay in her sofa for about three or four nights. That was the deal. Okay. I stayed for four weeks and then she was like, okay. get out of my house. <laughs> Um, and I went down the list of names, and one of them eventually turned into a homestay situation in Hamadayama on the Inokashira-san. Um, a very unusual situation to get a long-term homestay in Japan. Um, and I did it completely on my own. Um, and they were used to taking in fourth-year Japanese majors from the University of Pennsylvania. So they were like, approaching, certainly approaching conversational fluency. And I have like my six words of Japanese. And that was the toughest thing I've ever done in my life, was to live with his family. Um, and they'd been having students stay with him for like 15 years. So they had, they had an idea of, of what people needed to do. But I was a bit older, because I, no I was no longer a student. And Michiko-san and, and Kota-san, Kota-san came to my wedding uh, several years later. Michiko-san and I, um, we, were, we were sometimes like this, and sometimes we were really friendly. That was That's the mother. This, 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 was, this was my homestay mother. Okay, but then who's Koto's on her father? Her, her husband. husband. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, they had kids? They had one son, a little Your bit age? about my age, a little bit older actually. He okay. worked for Takashime. I'm assuming okay. he's, he's still there. Right, uh, right. You know, at this point, he'd be a senior. He's probably looking at retirement. Um, and uh, haven't, unfortunately, haven't stayed in touch with them over the years. We did for the first kind of 10 years or so. And then we, when we left Japan the first time, we, we started losing touch with people. Um, but they, they basically taught me how to eat Japanese, they taught me how to behave at a Japanese table, they taught me how to properly hold chopsticks, because I had got into all these arguments and fights with my Japanese homestay mom around how to do stuff, and how, how, like, you, know, how you walk in the house, and I knew nothing about Japan. I knew nothing. So I had a crash course in Japanese culture, like real Japanese culture, not, not the stuff you read in textbooks or go to the temples and stuff. This is like real living, and she taught me amazingly. Um, but we definitely, it was very stressful, probably for her too. I can imagine, <laughs> you know, dinner is at 6 o'clock and it's 6.05, you're late. And she's telling me all this in Japanese, they don't speak any right, English. Right, right, right. And she's obviously quite upset with me as, as I've noticed that moms, Japanese moms can tend to do <laughs> now okay. with three kids myself. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> um, but it was amazing training because when I came to Japan, I gave myself a year to make something happen. And a year and a day after I landed, I moved into the company dormitory of Chiodakako and started a career there for six and a half years as the first gaijin. And because of this, all this training that Michiko-san had done for me how on how to behave with, how long Japanese, how long about nine them? months. Nine months, wow. And I mean, well, you had to pay for this? Yes, how but it, it was Gomanen. <laughs> for the room and... Two, you mean the whole, for the whole time? It was no, per, month, month. Oh, per month, per okay. month, in. For the room? For the room, my own, my own room, room right. and breakfast and dinner, seven days a week. Wow. I mean, a deal. That's nothing. Deal. That's and, nothing. Real, and real home-cooked Japanese food. And it was just you in the house? There was another, they, had, they took two kids at a time. Two kids at a time. So the other one was actually uh, a, a still a student, and he was from the University of Pennsylvania, going, doing his senior year at uh, ICU. So he didn't want to talk to you at all? Oh, we, we became good buddies. Oh, did you really? Yeah, because and, and, and he would, he'd pull me Japanese. aside and say, like, look, this is you, what you need to do. Because <laughs> I was like pissing her off so much. <laughs> and we would laugh, Say but no. he's like, look, just do it a little bit differently. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it worked out well. But then I was with Chota for six and a half, seven years selling this technology that they had, had done extremely well selling in Japan, but they'd never been able to sell it outside of Japan. And I had no idea what I was doing, and after I got engaged, after the six months of struggling through the getting, you know, I think by the end of the six months, I was able to get through the first two and a half pages of the six-page newsletter. <laughs> 
But then, oh, okay, so clearly Japanese is not his strength. <laughs> right. But then I, I uh, they, they put me on, I started developing a relationship with Southern Electric International, uh, which is part of the Southern Company of the United States, which is Georgia Power, Alabama Power, Mississippi Power, and sorry, one other one, and then a group called SEI, Southern Electric International, which is a big engineering group. And they had a long-term relationship with Chioda, and they had built one of these scrubbers at an EPRI test facility just outside of Atlanta in Georgia. Um, and it, was, it wasn't commercial scale, but it was, it was like taking off the flue gas for about 20 or 30 megawatts worth of capacity, which is, right. which is sizable. I mean, probably twice the size of this room and three times as high, but that was, that was the pilot. And this is you know, well-proven commercial technology in Japan. Mm -hmm. every, almost every coal-fired power plant in Japan has one of these on it. Um, and so we started going and, and with their help, I created a relationship with them. And you know, after a 15 year relationship, they were talking to me and like, we finally get somebody who understands our jokes. Because nobody, <laughs> and they're all from Alabama. Right, it's um, seeing things and, and going over and, the head. And, right. and they, they'd come to Tokyo so many times to meet with Shodan. Great relationship, Randall Rush was the guy who was running it. An amazing guy. Um, he was in his mid to late 40s when I met him and I was in my early you know, mid 20s. Um, and we just, I did so many things with them. I went to Poland with them, went to the Czech Republic. We sold projects. We sold our first project in Canada, up in the oil sands. Um, so Suncor Corporation, which burns their own so, uh, tar sands, which is what they mine out. You know, they do, they do uh, uh, pit mining and they, it looks like the moon up there. Wow. Um, it's millions of acres, just completely devastated. It's more oil there than any place else in the world, and it's all in sand. And, the, the and where is this? It's in northern Alberta, a place called Fort McMurray. Wow. Um, and this is where all the pipelines like, so they have to come down from Canada, they okay. come into America. Right. It's all the oil from the oil sands. And this is nasty, nasty stuff. It's like 70% uh, sulfur. It's got lots of heavy metals in it. Um, but you literally put a shovel in the ground mm -hmm. and you get it. And, but it, it's, so they have this, this, this process heavy steam process where they, they, they mine the materials, and this is where you see the Komatsu 250 ton trucks, you see the giant bucket wheel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things rotating around, and, and it's just, you know, it's a huge place of these ginormous construction toys. <laughs> okay. Everything's on massive scale. Right. Um, and they have miles and miles and miles of conveyor belts to move the, the material as sands. It's, it's, you know, if you get it on your clothes, you never get it out. Mm -hmm. It's just tar. Mm -hmm. um, and they inject massive amounts of steam to separate the hydrocarbon out from the sand. Mm -hmm. And th it's nasty, nasty stuff, as I said. And they were burning their own fuel to power. They had a 350 megawatt equivalent power plant to pro for the processing. And uh, we sold the very first Chiyoda uh, Thoroughbred 121 jet bubbling reactor mm -hmm. to, to Suncor. We sold it in uh, using Fleur Daniel in Calgary. Um, and at the time that this thing is, I don't remember now exactly, it's maybe 40 meters across in diameter, the vessel, and about 25, 30 meters high. And we, it was a fiberglass vessel that we spun on site. It took nine months to spin it. And it, you know, it varies from, I don't know, 30, 35 degrees C to minus 35 degrees C up in that part of the world. Okay. Um, and at the time, it was the world's largest fiberglass, fiberglass structure. And at the bottom, it was like six inches thick. And at the top, it was like an inch thick. Okay. Um, and we put like a 1500 horsepower motor on the top of this thing. We put a huge mixer in the bottom. You know, the blades on the, the blades are like 20 meters long, right. ball mills, built a huge ginormous building. It was like a $250 million project. Okay. Um, and I'm 25, 26 years old. We finally sold one of these things. <laughs> Suncor, they won all the environmental awards of the year from Canada and from the Power Association and everything for creating this thing. Um, when we had the celebratory opening pow, uh, I brought my, my not of course the bucho, but the home bucho came over and went up there and I had my, my the seat next to me was the keg of, ca uh, of sake mm -hmm. and we brought happy coats for everybody. Right, right, right. I mean, we did, we did the Japanese thing. Um, and we went to Northern Canada and broke the keg open, broke the keg open and yes, kanpai, uh, great memories. Um, tried to do work with them in Russia. I was going to Russia a lot in the mid 90s, going to St. Petersburg and going to Moscow, went to the Ukraine. And at one point I was like, you know, if we could just fly five hours that way, we could get to my customer in Canada. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a really interesting time. But then I kind of had, to, I, went, I, know I, I went native in a big way. Okay. So I didn't know a single foreigner for the, for the five, next five years. 
in Japan. Thought, what about the guy that you said? Oh, that was in the so, house. Sorry, that in Japan. House. Sorry, in, in Japan. Japan. In Japan, okay. In Japan. So right. after I went to work for the company, I lived in the company dormitory, and then eventually we got married, and, and we rented a house in, uh, in Yokohama. She you wife actually speak Kawasaki. Did she, your wife speak English? She, she's ja she spoke about this much English we okay. met, and I spoke about this much Japanese. Um, and obviously it's worked out, because it's 28 years later, and we have three children. Three and kids, right. And uh, we're still putting up with each other. <laughs> so now you're with a new company, and yes. that company's SAP. SAP. And I joined them. So I was actually in, I, I've had a couple, from after Chiyoda, I went to a, yeah. did a couple of, of uh, management consulting gigs with the likes of Deloitte and E&Y, um, and then some smaller boutique firms. I worked for PeopleSoft for a little while. Um, and the, the, this firm called Headstrong, I joined them in 2005, which is a management consulting firm, but a smaller boutique one. Um, I built up their financial services practice in Japan and then spread that across Asia uh, and then was building using uh, IT guys from India and from the Philippines. So I think I actually created one of the very first offshore Indian service centers for Japanese clients mm -hmm. for Barclays Bank. This would have been in 2005, 2006. And we had a dedicated 15 guys in Bangalore supporting Barclays in Epicet. Mm. Um, for the middle office operations. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm pretty sure that was the very first Japanese off pure offshore center. Because um, we, we, it was before IBM, it was before Accenture, any of these guys were doing it for Japan. Well, um, any of these companies you work with, did you ever think that you'd want to be there for a long period of time, or did you come in there on a project basis? No, I was always coming in as, an, as a kaishain, as okay. an employee. Right. Um, and after three, four years, I, you know, I, the grass looks greener over there. <laughs> really? And you knew you could do it? You, I mean, w would you would you leap into that before you knew you had it, or would you know you had something else before you went? More off, I would generally know I had it before I went. So when okay. I gave notice to, to Chioda, I'd been recruited by Deloitte, and they moved okay. me to Australia. So in 19, Christmas of 97, we so. moved to Australia, stayed down in Australia for three and a half. Two of my three kids were born in Australia. So that means you're building a name for Wait, people know about you. They're finding out about what you've done for the companies you're with. I hope so. I don't know. They find out. Know. Well, why would they recruit you? How would they know to do that? I you met them. Were you doing any business with them? Prior? No, no. no. Uh, sorry, the, when I joined PeopleSoft, I wasn't doing business with PeopleSoft, but I'd been doing business with Siebel. And the, a guy named Murray Crichton had been running Siebel Asia, and he moved over to PeopleSoft. Right. So there and he, he called me and said, okay. hey, and I think the story was, I can't hire anybody from Siebel, so would you come work for me? <laughs> But he knew what you were doing. You yeah, so I was running the CRM practice right, okay. for, for right. Capgem, what was in Capgem. Because you're not going yeah. through recruiting offices, companies. Are Nobody. You? You're not so I have no recruiters ever been able to place me. That's what I'm saying. And so. I've never gotten a job. Every single job I've ever had was created for me. I hear you. There's literally so every that's, job. It's word of mouth. That means that you're good at what you're doing, obviously, uh -huh. and people know that so that when they go someplace else, they want to take Paul with them. They right. say, we can well, get Paul to come. That's yeah, it. yeah. I mean, I. In a way. But, but I'm. But I'm. I, I seem to be good at jumping and not necessarily. You know, I want to do something. I get. I guess I get bored too quickly. Okay. Um, but you obviously complete what you're doing when you're there. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I don't. I don't like playing company politics as well. And after I've had some success, you know, there, there's this this saying that failure is, is an orphan and success has many fathers. <laughs> so so yeah, I was generally generating successes and right. probably because I don't want to play politics, I probably wasn't always saying hey. That was my deal. I'm the originator of that. You let it go, right? I hear you. And you know, I'm I hear you. Maybe to my detriment, but that's just that's who I am. So, but you know, it's worked out. It's worked out. But the the Headstrong company in 2011 got acquired by a company called Gempack, which is the old the GE spin out of doing all the back office stuff in India and China, like the original business process outsourcing company. And they moved me to China in, at the end of 2011. So I spent nine years in Shanghai. Um, loved it was with Gempack for about three years and then left and became an entrepreneur and started my own company. Which is? Uh, it was called iCity Global. I see. Um, and it was doing smart building solutions integrations, um, IoT in the building, on-site power generation, uh, LED lighting, sensors in the buildings, space planning, uh, all kinds of energy efficiency projects. I was working in all these factories in China. Um, and you know, I, that's that's how I got myself back into sustainability after my experience in Chiyoda 20 years earlier. Um, that went really, so it was an, a great learning experience. Did some really interesting projects, and it was a financial disaster. For how long? <laughs> how long period was it? Not quite four years. 
Okay. Oh, so you so I had to go. I had six employees at the peak. I was representing 35 different best of breed companies into China that had the really cool tech or really cool solutions that, you know, they were generally selling it to United Technologies or Johnson Controls or Honeywell. And I say, no, I want to I buy direct from the source and I'm going to do some stuff with brownfield buildings. I'm not looking at greenfield buildings. Um, and so that was really interesting. But it was, uh, it, it turns out, you know, I've, I've had a number of entrepreneurial opportunities over my career, mm -hmm. and uh, I now I have so here. much respect now for entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I've done it once; I, it was a financial failure, and every other way, it was a major success. Um, but I just I ran out of money. I ran out of my you know cash flow. I get to the point, okay, well, I have to pay my employees, so I'm going to pay my employees, and then I, I probably should pay the rent so we don't lose the office. And my wife is saying she wants food money for food. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> we got to cut through this somewhere. Um, so I ended up doing a deal that didn't work out that well. We sold the company to group in Australia, and eventually we had to fold the company. Mm -hmm. um, and then I stayed for a couple of years then working in China, doing some freelance advisory work, doing working with smart building companies, smart houses, some autonomous vehicle stuff, um, and then also did uh, an interim general manager role, uh, country manager role for a negotiation consultancy that was coming into China that's run by a good friend of mine. And then uh, uh, eventually uh, SAP reached out to me through, through a friend. I'd let the market know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, I need something. I need something. Okay. And uh, they came back and said, hey, we think we've got something. It was a really long courtship. Um, it, it took many, many, like, Many months, many, many interviews, and eventually they said, okay, we'd like to hire you, and then COVID As kicked the in. COVID kicked okay, in. Okay, COVID kicked in, right. Um, and so then I ended up getting kind of stuck in China, um, and I quit my job, and SAP said, well, we can't actually put you on the payroll until you're physically in Japan. And so there was about two or three months where it was like, what are we gonna do? There's no income at all. Um, I have a job. It won't get started. Right. But eventually, in November of 2020, we got on, the window opened a little bit. There was one flight a day, uh, one flight a week between Shanghai and Tokyo then. Um, and prior to COVID, there were like 40 flights a day. So there's one a week. And we have a dog. And that flight will take three animals per flight in, in, you know, under, un, in the under, under, underside. Right. And so we were able to get it, once we figured it all out, six months out, we got the ticket and said, all right, we have our, we have our date, we have our start date. And so I came back to join SAP in this really unusual role that got created basically for me, as far as I can tell, called International Ambassador. Right. And what I do in this job is I work with Japan headquartered companies and help them further globalize their operations using whatever we've got in the SAP toolkit. So of course, almost everybody knows SAP as being the ERP company when that's, we're, we're probably the world's largest ERP company for sure. Um, I think you know, 99 of the 100, Fortune 100 are all using SAP. 77% of the world's companies, of the world's business transactions, will touch an SAP solution. 85% of the world's supply chain touches SAP. It's, it's a phenomenal company, and it just, it just it has such an impact on the world. Um, and so it was, after my experience of being an entrepreneur, um, I was like, you know, I think I'm going to go back to somebody that's got deep pockets, because <laughs> I'm not so good at, at you know, doing everything I need to do to keep a business going. Um, but at the same time that I joined them, they were getting pretty serious about their sustainability solutions. And that, so that just was like another tick in the box. Like, okay, this, is, this definitely is the right move for me. Um, so I've done it. I've been here almost two years now. Um, and I'm spending a good portion of my time actually on the sustainability stuff. Um, and I'm talking to CEOs and board members all around Japan at the big Japanese companies. And I generally start my discussions off, you know, I'm, I'm from SAP, I'm a national pastor. What is your company doing about ESG? What are you doing about sustainability? How are you going about it? You know, how are you, are you tracking it? How many spreadsheets does it actually require you to do your report? Because we know almost everybody's using spreadsheets. And it's like, we have no idea. We think it's like 9,000 spreadsheets. And, you know, we need to know 16 months in advance we're going to create an integrated sustainability report because it takes us that long to pull the data together. So that's not the only thing we do. And, and there are a lot of com competitors out there that make... Uh, reporting solutions for sustainability, mm -hmm. but we're also getting into all the carbon tracking, all the um, plastics and, and circular economy solutions, a mm -hmm. um, bunch of HR related stuff, all the travel and expense, and then you know tracking. So what is the CO2 of that flight versus taking the train versus walking? <laughs> 
um, and then pull all that data together and generate both both reports for the CFO and the, and the CPO and the CSO, as well as for the operational teams, here's the insights of if you start tweaking with some of these, all, you know, the, the 200 different things, inputs, you can actually start to see your emissions going down. You can start to see water usage going down. You can start to see circular economy things starting to happen. So create a degree of design um, and you go all the way back to the source. Um, so actually all the way back to like the farm or the mine. And we can, we've now got software solutions that we can, using blockchain technologies, we can actually trace you know, the iron ore or the hydrogen or the palm oil almost at a molecular level as it goes all the way through the supply chain. So we know that the Mars bar that you might buy at the 7-Eleven down the street, um, if they're so inclined, we can actually tell you where the palm oil came for that particular... Everything in it, actually. Every, yeah, we can. Now, now we're, it's still early days, um, but we're, that's clearly in 10 years. We'll be able to do that for everything, all the carpet, all the chairs, everything we do. So it's really exciting so and really I get really interested. And it gives you hope for it, mankind. It, it gives me hope and it gives That's me purpose. Right. And it's, right. it's this purpose, I mean this idea of like a purpose-driven company is so important. Isn't that the truth? Because when you have this purpose, you know, well, I'm, like, I'm excited to get up in the morning right. and go to work. You want to because you want to It's not really get, work. You want to get it there. <laughs> you want to get us to where we want to be. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, uh, and, and, and I, you know, as people may know, I post a lot on LinkedIn in particular. I also do Twitter, but I do mostly LinkedIn. And most of my posts are about sustainability. Sustainability and globalization. Those are my two kind of things that, that have kept me going forever. I would, I would imagine the reason why is because you know it is a possible, it's happening. It is happening. I mean, and that's what makes it makes you you become. What can I say? Just like in religious terms. Mm. It actually it, it is a religion, dude. There's no question. I'm, 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 I'm and I'm a priest in the Church of Sustainability. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not just I a parishioner. I I'm a preach. I I'm a preacher. You get up there. <laughs> I get up there. Let me ask you this, Paul. I like to end the the the, the podcast with this. Okay. What advice mm. would you give the twenty year old mm. Paul? Don't have as much fun when you're that young, <laughs> but it works out. <laughs> um, keep, you know, you're going to be okay. Keep chasing your dreams. Um, you're, you know, you're choosing the path, the road less traveled. Um, be, be smarter about what you do with your money and who you give your money to to help you. Man, I'm, I've been fairly good at making money. I haven't been really good at sometimes hanging on to it because I've, I've, I've unfortunately not done enough due diligence with some of the people that I've, I've gotten involved with. Um, I'm okay, but I, you know, I should be able to say I'm, I'm almost financially done and I'm, I'm, I'm never going to probably stop working because you know, as long as I have something with a purpose, I'm going to keep doing it. Um, but just be a little bit smarter about hanging on to your assets. Thank you. My pleasure. Lance, before we finish, I need to okay. give you something. So I, one of the things I post about, and I've been doing this now for like six months, is I have an organic garden in, in, in Tokyo. A little, like, small plot, two, two and a half square meters, urban farming. And we planted about three months ago a piemon tree. And this damn tree throws off like 100 piemons a week. So this is yesterday's output Thank you so much. for you. Because wow. I am tired of eating piemon every meal for every Look at day. This. That's one day's output from one tree. <laughs> Wait, what do you do? You put something special in it to make it grow like this? Or what? It's dirt and sun. Just and, dirt and sun and, and, and water. Lot of love and care. And, and uh, grid so soil. Much. And it's all organic. Um, so enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank th th you th th there's a dozen piemons I don't have to eat now. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for watching this podcast. Make sure you press like and subscribe. And remember, it's all on loan, so reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed. Mm -hmm.